this celebration of the Palm Sunday begins the celebration of what we have referred to as the Holy Week. The week where, which begins with Christ riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, on the, the fowl of a donkey, a young colt, one that had never been ridden before, one that was not proved, and yet the Creator did not, uh, did not need someone to train the animal that, it, that carried him. And, the, and Christ rode into Jerusalem to the cries and the shouts and the praise of the multitudes and the, and the disciples and to the palms that were thrown along the path and the cloaks that were removed from the shoulders and tossed down for the king to have a smooth path into Jerusalem. And then just a few, uh, just a few days later, those cries of Hosanna, blessed be the king, would turn into the cries of crucify him. And we choose Barabbas, what a shift, what a change in the mouths of those there that week. And it would be negligent and shameful if we were to think that in some ways we are much different. In fact, we hopefully navigate this life with Christ But unfortunately, even those who claim the name of Christ can at times work through life on their own. They don't use and access the power that the king brings. In the moments in church when we loudly proclaim, Hosanna, praise to God, can quickly turn to something else on Monday or Tuesday when life doesn't turn out just like we anticipated. In John chapter 12, we find the account, John's account of the triumphal entry. It begins in verse number 12 of John chapter 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees And went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. And look at verse 16, please. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. Now, one would think that if you walked with Jesus, if you talked with Jesus, if you listen to Jesus, if you experience the miracles of Jesus, that you would have got it. One would think that if you had, had seen a, a lady plagued by demons and then freed and loosed from that bondage, you would think, I'm going to listen this, to this individual. One would think that if you had been there the day that Jesus cried, Lazarus, come forth which happened just in this book a chapter earlier, chapter 11. One would think that if you had observed Lazarus walking out of the tomb where he had been laid, and if you had maybe been part of unwrapping the grave clothes from Lazarus, one would think that you would take note. And yet the Bible multiple times repeats this type of phrase about the disciples that They didn't catch what Jesus was doing. They didn't notice what he had said. They didn't remember about his resurrection. And all the way up until the crucifixion, they had missed the point. They missed the point. Even asking questions like, Lord, when you reign, can we be by your right hand and left hand? They missed the point. And yet they're not off the hook. They're not excused and neither are we. We have not had occasion yet to see Jesus Christ face to face, but one day we will. We have not had occasion yet to touch his hands or his nail pierced side, but one day we shall see him as he is. 
And Jesus said, blessed are those who having not seen belief. Tonight as we approach Isaiah chapter 6, I want to remind us again this week is the single most, I would submit the single most important week we celebrate in all of Christian history and in all of human history. But many will miss it. Unsaved and saved. There's more to Easter than the Easter bunny. In a chocolate basket. And yet I imagine, I'm afraid that for many Christians, even, even perhaps some in this room, that more time has been spent on what you will wear for Easter than remembering who Jesus is. This morning we preached a message. I preached a message on when I hear from the king. And tonight I want to preach a message when I see the king. It's a little boy who happened to be sick on a Palm Sunday of years past. When his mom came home from church that Sunday morning, he observed that she had a palm branch. And he, being a young, inquisitive boy, asked his mother, where did you get that palm branch? And she said, well, I got it at church because when Jesus came in to the city, they brought palm branches. And the young boy, with all the despair in his little, his little life, stomped his foot and said, man... The one Sunday I miss, and Jesus comes to town. Now, but lest I forget tonight, these palm branches, I would encourage you to take them. Young children, there's enough for all of you to have one. And each family, I'm sure, can take one tonight. And put it somewhere in your home, and perhaps this week, as you look at the palm branch, it may take your mind back to what this week is about. Beginning with the triumphal entry, in the middle, not, not ending with the crucifixion, of course. All right, some would have said it ended with the crucifixion, but my friends, that was, that was merely a hotel stay for Jesus Christ. All right, that was, that was just a passing, that was a passing stop because the week ended, the week ended with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that wasn't the end, it's really the beginning and why you and I can sit here tonight. This morning, I challenged you to think, what if Jesus Christ walked down the aisle this morning? And walked up on the stage and spoke to us. What would our reaction be? What would our response be? Or in essence, I ask us to picture, what if Jesus was in this room this morning? And tonight I want to turn that one other direction. And not ask you to picture if Jesus were in this room. But what if tonight we went to his room? Because in Isaiah chapter 6 tonight, when we open up, uh, when we get there to that passage... We're going to see what happens when someone peeks into, when Isaiah peeks into the throne room of God, or what happens when someone goes into God's room. This morning, I believe that all of us had a similar response, that if Jesus were to show up this morning or tonight and to be in this room, that we would stay as long as necessary and not complain Hunger could, could set, be set aside, or time could be set aside. Anything in our list of, of to-dos that we want to accomplish today or tomorrow or for a few days would be set aside for Jesus Christ as he taught to us. What amount of time would be too much to spend with Christ? But even much more vast and grand is the thought that we could appear and see into, into God's throne room. And that's just what happened in Isaiah chapter 6. So if you have your Bibles, please turn. Isaiah chapter 6. What happens when I see the king? You see, the disciples that day, they saw the king, and they, didn't, they weren't even moved by it. In fact, they didn't even remember it until after he was glorified. Can you imagine if, if you could see God in his glory and not recognize it? Not connect the dots? To say, a while later, two months later or so, oh, that was God. Well, that was neat. This is the disciples. And yet, and yet we can, through his word, get a glimpse of God and his holiness. We can, through the word of God, glimpse the majesty and the authority of God Almighty. And we must, we must not miss it. Isaiah chapter 6, beginning in verse number 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it 
stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain or two, he covered his face. And with twain, he covered his feet. And with twain, he did fly. Someone has asked, do angels have wings? I don't know if they all have wings, but seraphims have six. Do angels fly? Seraphims do. And they got two to fly with and two to cover their feet and two to cover their eyes, their face. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and that the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king. Would you read that phrase to me, please? For mine eyes have seen the king. Can you believe that? Isaiah got to see the king. What a day. And through his word, we can still see the king. But what happens? What should happen when we see the king? If that's the Lord's blessing, and then we'll unpack this passage. Lord, sure do love you. We're thankful for the time that we have to spend in your word tonight. And Lord, I pray that you would move us tonight. Open up this passage in our hearts and our minds and spiritually touch us, Lord. Would your spirit have freedom in this place? And Lord, would everything that you wish to accomplish be done here? As you've asked us to pray that your kingdom would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, keep it, the service free from distractions, all the things that could snatch away the seed of your word. And Lord, we'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. I ask and pray. Amen. The Bible says that Isaiah got a glimpse of heaven. And what a glorious glimpse it was. He says he saw the Lord high and lifted up. This is one, if not the overarching theme of Isaiah, that God is not like man. God is up here and we are down here. That God is high and lifted up and we ain't. Now, we will lift up our own thoughts, imaginations, in our minds, in our life. But reality, the truth is, God is up here and you and I are down here. God is high and lifted up. And Isaiah, in this vision, saw God's authority. He saw God's glory. And he saw God's honor. And he saw worship. He saw true worship where the seraphims proclaimed in, in a three holy Holy, holy. What a powerful worship. Christians ought to take note of the worship of God that Isaiah observed because too many Christians want to worship God in their own way. They want to worship like they want their hamburgers to drive through, order it their way, and drive away. And God and the worship of God is not drive through. It is not drive in and drive out. In fact, if we were to get a glimpse of God tonight, none of us would want to walk away, except in fear and reverence. None of us would say, you know what? I've seen enough. I'm out of here. None of us would say, you know, God, the seraphim was nice, but let's tweak him a little bit. I know the six wings was nice. What about four? Have you thought about eight? Glimpse of God would not cause us to offer a suggestion to God. Yet Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, had the curtain pulled back on the glory of God that fills the heaven. And I hope tonight he fills this room, and I pray he fills your life and your heart and your family this week. What happens when we truly see the king? In this passage, Isaiah has four responses that I believe we ought to have in the same way that Isaiah has. Four responses that when someone truly sees the king is a response that they will have. And that if you don't have these responses, then you have not truly glimpsed the king. It is one thing to say you have a glimpse of the king. 
and another thing to truly glimpse the king. Notice, please, in this passage, he tells us, he explains what happens. Look, please, in verse number five. Isaiah says this, Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man. When you see the, the king, number one, you and I, you will recognize yourself. I will recognize myself. When we truly see the king, we will understand just how high God is and just how small we are. Who are we to think that we could offer anything to God besides, his, besides an answer of worship to his grace and strength? What else can we offer? And yet in our minds, we become so puffed up. We become so elevated to think that we can navigate life, that we can do anything apart from God. When you glimpse the king, when you see King Jesus, you will understand. I will understand. The whole world will understand. There is nothing that we have to offer. He is up here and we are down here. And that is why the Bible says in the New Testament that at the name of Jesus, every knee will, shall, they will bow. They will see King Jesus and they will understand, oh my goodness, whatever I thought about him, Whatever I said about him was completely wrong. All the mocking going on in this current time and well before this current time. All the, all, all the, all the ways they persecuted him before and after. All the ways they reject him now and, and try to make a fool of Jesus Christ. When they see him in his glory and his majesty and his authority, they will understand what Isaiah understood. They will know who they are. And you and I, when we get a glimpse of Jesus Christ and see the king, we will see ourselves. And if you're here tonight and you're full of yourself and you're full of your ideas and you're full of your plans and you're full of your dreams and you're full of yourself, you've not seen Jesus. Because when you see the king, you can't help but have the response that Isaiah had, woe is me. I am undone. That word undone is an interesting word. It means I have no answer and no power. Or in essence, we could say that Isaiah is sitting there with his knees knocking, perhaps on a heap on the floor, mouth slack, jaw slack. There is nothing that Isaiah could think of to say. He's undone. <laughs> I'm a man, you're the supreme this morning, the choir sang the song Majesty. I love that song. Choir did a great job this morning, Orchestra. Thank you for playing and singing. The song was written by a man named Jack Hayford. It was written in the 19, uh, 1970s, actually, when he wrote the song Majesty. He wrote it after taking a trip with his wife, uh, after going through Great Britain, Wales, and Scotland. And after driving through uh, these, these countries and the countryside and stopping at castle after castle, and seeing the, the majestic displays of workmanship, he could not help but, but think about not of man, but of God. And seeing the country, the countryside, the castles, he went, came back, and they together wrote down the words of the song, Majesty. Worship his majesty unto Jesus. Be glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom Authority flows from his throne unto his own, his anthem praise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Woe is me, for I am a man and I'm undone. Have you seen Jesus? Have you sat back and said, you know what? I'm nothing. Have you had a holy undoing where you look at your life and you're like, <laughs> there's nothing I can do. I'm not talking about when you're at wit's end, when the problem's that big. I'm talking about when you're on top of the world and you see the successes and you say, woe is me. I'm undone. I'm just a man. All hail King Jesus. When you see the king, you will respond like Isaiah, I'm undone. It was about 15 years ago now, maybe, maybe 14 years ago now. 
I'd gone out to Lancaster Baptist Church. I'd gone to interview a young man and his wife by the name of Danny Galdamez and Ashley. Interview apparently went well. They're still here to this day. And I had heard that Brother Galdamez was a pretty good basketball player. I had heard that. Those of you who have not seen him play, he is a very good basketball player. And he's still better than you boys. I see those comments landing. I got good vision right here. <laughs> they were playing, I remember the school they were playing that night. And they were playing this school, and the school was maybe a Division three or Division II division school. It was one of those matchups that sometimes these schools will have with the Christian college, just pay to have the matchup. And uh, unfortunately, though as good a player as Brother Goldemez is and was at that time, in college playing all the time, they were far outmatched by this team. I was there that, that day. I think Tyler Evans was sitting with me at the game that night. There were a couple of the boys and uh, watching this basketball game. And I still remember that I was sitting there on the sidelines and watching this other team play. They had a very tall center. Don't know how tall, but taller than me, which is not saying much, but an excellent basketball player. I watched as one of the other team players shot a jump shot and Missed the shot a little bit, and the ball bounced off the rim and bounced up and bounced toward the free throw line. I watched as this center seemed to elevate seemingly from the free throw line, though I'm sure it wasn't that far of a jump. Grabbed the ball over the top of every player there at, at West Coast Baptist College, and with two hands soared above them and slammed the ball down over them. I remember looking at Tyler, the boys, and I'm like, you know what, game's over. Because no matter what they're doing, no matter how good they are, they're not jumping from in front of the free throw line, grabbing the ball seemingly 15 feet up in the air, all right, probably said hello to a hot dog before they dunked the ball. You know, that man that night who did that, if I'd played basketball against him, it wouldn't be a contest, would it? No matter what I would do, I wouldn't win, short of maybe knocking him out <laughs> Some. Some, some cheating scandal. And my friends, just in a small way, when you see the king, when you see the king, you can't help but say, you know what, there is nothing I can do. I'm undone. But notice, not only did he see himself, and we must see ourselves, but notice what else he said. He's, in verse number five, then said I, woe is me, for I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Isaiah not only saw himself and recognized himself, Isaiah recognized his sin. When you see the king, when you see the majesty of God, your sin will become evident. Any excuse that we make, any self-justification, any hiding will be nothing compared to the light of God's glory. And Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips. You see, God wants us to see our sin not in our own vision because we can excuse it. We can reason it away. We can say, well, it's not as bad as someone else's sin. And it's not as bad as I used to be. And it's not as bad as I could be. And God says the comparison is not yourself and your own imaginations. The comparison is my glory and my majesty and my holiness. Holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah says, I am a man of unclean lips. What was Isaiah dealing with? He says here he had unclean lips. Just a thought, he was not categorically just saying he was undone. He was being very specific. He was saying that, that he had a problem with his speech. Maybe. Maybe. I don't think so, but, but maybe uh, he didn't speak the right kind of words. Or maybe he was a complainer. 
Maybe Isaiah was a complainer. Maybe he was a critical person. Had a problem with speech. Maybe he struggled with being unkind. Isaiah wasn't perfect. Right, but Isaiah says, I, I have a problem and, and I'm, I'm noticing it again when I see the king and the problem is my unclean lips and, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. Now we know the problem of Israel. They were saying things that were good were bad and bad were good. They were saying it wasn't God, it was a Baal, it was another false god. I don't think Isaiah worshipped a false god. I don't think that was it. We can't see that anywhere in Isaiah. But apparently Isaiah had some problem with the speech. Some issue. That's what he said. I, I, I have unclean lips. Woe is me. I'm undone. I have no answer for it. I have no justification for it. And the Bible doesn't tell us what the issue was, but it does tell us that, that Isaiah recognized that he was a man and unclean in this fashion. He didn't try to hide it. He didn't try to say, you know what, I'll get it right next week. I'll deal with it later on. He said, I've got nothing. You see, when someone sees the king, they'll recognize their sin. And they will quit placating and playing with it. And they will quit hiding it and justifying it. They will, they will quit blaming your lack of forgiveness is not someone else's fault, it's your fault. Your criticism and critical spirit is not the situation, it's you. All right, it's you that has a problem. And it's all of us, it's me, it's you, all right. It's not someone else's problem, it's, it's my problem, it's your problem. Or right, we can't blame someone else. But when we see the king, we recognize our own sin. I was a football coach. His name was Eric or Irk Russell, Georgia Southern College. And apparently in his boys there that were playing football for him, some had a problem with cocaine. And so he wanted to deal with it. So one day, during a team meeting, unbeknownst to the team, he hired two good old rednecks, rednecks. And right during the team meeting, they came blasting into the, into the, into the room with, all the, with the whole team there, and they tossed two uh, six-foot-long rattlesnakes right in the middle of the guys. And the room cleared out, apparently. Which it would if I tossed a rattlesnake in here tonight. If I brought one inside this room, you'd leave. There, there's only a few crazies in here who'd be like, I want to see this thing closer. The rest of you who are sane, right, Brad, would you stick around? You'd probably want to come. Yeah, you're okay, you're crazy. Yeah. But most of the majority would be, you know what? I'm out of here. We're calling animal control. We're calling somebody. We're calling another redneck, whatever it is. But I'm not sticking around. And Eric Russell said to his boys that day, he said, you are more scared of rattlesnakes and you are cocaine. And my friends, I'm afraid that we're more scared of rattlesnakes than we are of sin. And it's because we haven't seen the king. Because when we see the king, we can't help but say, I'm just a man and recognize ourselves and see our sin and say, you know what, and I am unclean. And it may be in your mind, it may be with your speech, it may be with your unforgiving heart. It may be with your gossip. It could be with bitterness. Whatever your poison is, you'd be more scared of a rattlesnake than sin because you haven't seen the king. Susanna Wesley, she was the mother of John Wesley. She said to her young son when she was teaching him about sin, she said, John, if you would judge of the lawfulness or unlawfulness of pleasure, then take this simple rule or judge things to be sinful by this. Whatever weakens your reason and pairs the tenderness of your conscience, obscures your sense of God and takes off the delight of spiritual things, that to you, my son, is sin. Tonight I wonder if we need to see the king again. To look at our life and say, I'm a man, and I'm undone because I have unclean fill in the blank. But notice what happens next. 
Isaiah is there and he's in this vision. He sees the king, he sees the glory, he sees the majesty, he sees the authority, he sees the honor. He recognizes himself, he recognizes his sinful state. Then look at verse number six, please. We continue on the passage. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. These two verses, verse 6 and 7, I admit, are, are somewhat at first glance a conundrum. You're like, what is happening here in the throne room of God that a seraphim flies to the altar and grabs a burning coal and touches in the vision to Isaiah his lips and then says, thy sin is purged and thy, thy iniquity is purged and thy sin is gone. Like, like what, what is going on here? Like, is there some supernatural coal burning thing? What, what is happening? And I think upon closer examination, I can understand just a couple truths for you or to help you. Because the truth is this, that Isaiah, and here's the, the, the big truth, Isaiah recognized, all right, remember he recognized himself, he recognized his sin, but now he recognized his salvation. All right, he recognized his salvation. So notice, notice what's happening here, though, that a seraphim is doing this. Now, a seraphim, uh, if you look back at the word, is a fire, it talks about the fire. All right, so in essence, this being is so bright, it appears it's on fire. Yet it goes... All right, and we find this, in, in fact, when Moses lifts up the fiery serpent, almost almost exact same word, all right? Almost exact same word. Remember, they looked to the fiery serpent when he lifted up in bronze and saw salvation, all right? A neat, neat comparison there. But this seraphim goes over to the altar that is found in the throne, of, in throne room of God. And yet this seraphim, who was, who, who obviously is holy, not holy like God, but he's, there's no sin and iniquity inside of this, this being, cannot touch this live coal on the altar. He cannot just grab it. You notice the scripture says he grabs tongs. He used tongs to grab this live coal. Because whatever was on the altar was put there by God himself. And the Bible says that our God is a consuming fire. In fact, the book of Jeremiah says this, that the word of God is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. And the picture here is that God himself is cleansing Isaiah. The picture that God is doing the cleansing. Now, it does not appear in this passage, all right, I would not say that Isaiah needed a full cleansing. I would remind you of Peter and the washing of the feet. Remember Jesus was washing feet and he's washing Peter's feet and Peter's like, hey, you know what? Don't wash my feet. I'll wash your feet. And Jesus says, no, you need your feet washed by me. And Peter says, great. Don't, don't just wash my feet. Wash all of me. And Jesus is like, my goodness, Peter, you never get it right. My own version right there. I apologize. And he said, Peter, no, you don't need that because you've been cleansed, but, but you've gotten dirty. You've gotten dirty. So let me wash your feet. Right? The Bible talks how the word washes us and cleanses. So after salvation, our iniquity has been purged, been covered. And I believe that last part of the verse, verse number seven, talks about when thy sin is purged, all right, that your sin is covered. All right, so that's not an issue, but you need to be cleansed, all right? And so he's saying, listen, you need to be touched by me. And, and Isaiah recognizes that nothing he could do, and here it is, nothing he could do could cleanse himself. That God in his glory had to do it. And yet, in your life and my life, there's nothing that we can do. It's only what God can do. Cleansing comes from God. The washing comes from God. I can't be good enough or make myself clean enough. I must merely rest in what God has done and what he is doing and what he will do. When you see the king, you again are reminded, even in my filthiness and my own struggles, that God, I need you to help me and to cleanse me. And I can't beat this struggle. I can't beat this problem. You're going to have to. And God says, okay. So sit back and let me work. Just be in that place and I'll touch you. All right, I'll help you. It won't be you. It will be me. What a blessing. What a blessing, Christians, that we're not just like, listen, as long as we work a little harder and labor more. No, it's the fact that God will touch us again and help us. 1952, I got a story. Betty Crocker, the company, 
launched an instant cake mix. Just add water. Now, ladies and men, how many have used the instant cake mix to this day? Come on. John, you don't make cake? No? All right, fair enough. It's just add water. They'd just come out of the war, and uh, women had been in the factories. They were trying to help uh, some things, and, and there was a shortage of flour, other ingredients, so they, they had this cake mix just add water. And it was a major flop. They were shocked. They were shocked that they could not sell instant cake mixes. They thought this was the answer to all life's problems. You know, Betty Crocker, like, this is it. So they hired a company, two men, I believe it was, or just a company, to discover the problem. And they found out that it was too easy. That no one trusted a cake mixer you just added water. That they said that this can't be good. That this is, there has to require some work. And so <laughs> what they did was genius. They just added to the box, add one egg. And they sold like hotcakes. Apparently the egg was not necessary to the mixture, but to selling the product. And what a deception, what a deception the devil still gives to you and to me. Let God work, that's too easy. Even in salvation, just trust in Jesus Christ, that's too easy. And yet here when we recognize, when we see the king and we recognize salvation, all right, we don't have to add anything. Not for salvation, all right, and then we just let his word cleanse us. And Isaiah here, when he sees the king, he sees himself, and he's undone. He's got nothing, and God has everything. He sees his sin, and he recognizes again just what a filthy, rotten man he is. And then again, he sees the grace of God, who will say, I know you're helpless, Isaiah. Allow me to fix your problem. When you see the king, you sit back, and you let God work. One more thing that Isaiah sees, we can see one more response. Isaiah is purged and cleansed, and then we hear this request in verse number eight. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now imagine for a moment, please, Isaiah in this vision. He's in the throne room of God. He's seen the glory of God, the majesty, the honor. He's seen the seraphim, six wings, two here, two here, and two flapping around. He's realized himself. He's realized his sin. He's been touched by a live coal off the altar, carried there by tongs. He's been purged. And then he hears the voice. You hear God says, who will I send? Who will go? You see, when you see the king, there's only one response. Now, before you get to Isaiah's response, you know what his response is. You probably even looked ahead at it or you've heard it before. But I picture it this way, if you just bear with me for a moment. Can you picture the kid in first grade who always answers in class? All right, and the teacher asks the question and she wants someone else to answer a little bit. Are you with me so far? And there's always this one kid, right? And they're like this. Me, 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 right, right, right. And they're like, and the teacher, all right, good teacher in dream, you probably do this in class regularly. And they're like, okay, I'm looking, I'm looking for answer number two. All right, and this little kid, what's he doing? What was he doing? Both hands. What does teacher do? Okay, is there anyone who knows the answer? Me, 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 me. Okay, Johnny, what, what's the answer? And they're bursting out, five! Okay, good. Is there anyone else? Can you not see Isaiah respond this way? When the Lord says, who shall I send? Who will go? It's like Isaiah elevates off the ground. Whoa, here am I, send me, send me, send me, send me, send me. Woo-hoo! Lord, right here, right here, down here, down here. Woo-hoo! Me, 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 me. Look at it. Verse number eight. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. There's no way. There's no way that Isaiah sat there. Yeah, here am I. 
send me. No way. No way. You will never convince me of that. I think you'd be anti-biblical if you thought that. Thanks, Cal. Give, give me an amen right there. Uh, there's no way. There's no way that he waited. Because when you see the king and you see yourself, when you see the king and you see your sin, when you see the king and you see the cleansing that God offers, when you see the king, you will be willing to serve. You know what happens in our life? We need someone to pass out some tracks. You haven't seen the king. You haven't seen the king. He calls on your life to give the gospel, to witness. You haven't seen the king. You haven't seen the king. You feel the tug to get involved in a ministry, to serve in a capacity in a local church, which is completely scriptural and biblical. Ah, boy, I look at my schedule. Boy, I already do a lot around here. Man, someone else should do something. You look at everybody else. You haven't seen the king. You see, when you see the king, you're not pointing anybody else. When you see the king, you're at the front of the line, jumping off your seat, clapping your hands together, shouting and making noises and making any way to get the king's attention. Here am I, send me. You see, when you see the king, you're gonna be ready to serve. You know, Paul saw the king. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. He says, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you still think you're something, if you still think you're all that in a bag of Doritos, you've not seen the king. If you still think your sin is okay, you've not seen the king. If you still think you can fix it, if you still think you have the answers, you've not seen the king. And if you still think it's someone else's job, you've not seen the king. What happens when we see the king? Life's different. Problems are solved. Sin is transformed. And service is energized. So have you seen the king? Not have you said you've seen the king and claim to have seen him, but have you seen the king? Because when you see the king, you cannot help but respond this way. Invitation simple. If you need to see the king tonight, then look full in his wonderful face. And you'll recognize I'm nothing. And I got problems. And he can solve them. And I'll do whatever he wants me to do. Choose me. Choose me.